Let's sing it now. Sing the chorus. Signs of the time, they're everywhere. There's a brand new feeling in the air. Keep your eyes upon. this morning our redemption draweth nigh well isn't it good to be back in the house of the Lord on Sunday morning what an opportunity and privilege that it is we had a tremendous time here last night if you didn't get to be here well we just uh, uh, I feel sorry for you because it was just really good it was just a good tremendous service brother how many of you appreciate what brother Matt brought to us last night the word of the Lord wasn't it so good amen the spirit of fear is a terrible thing. And it can come in so many forms and so many ways that sometimes we're not even aware of it. But God is a deliverer. He is our deliverer. Do you believe that this morning? Somebody say praise the Lord. Somebody say praise the Lord. Let's give him a real good hand clap if you love him with all your heart this morning. Amen. Turn around, shake somebody's hand, greet them in the name of the Lord, tell them you're glad to see them in church on Sunday morning. What a privilege and opportunity that it is to be in the house of God. Play a little bit more of that, brethren, if you would. I know that signs of the time.
Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. I only have a couple of prayer requests. If you just remain standing with me, we'll, Brother Rob, if you get ready this morning to take us to the Lord in prayer. I want to have pray for Cornelia Sorrow from Georgia, who is, uh, according to what they're, they're saying, the doctors are saying, doesn't have long to live. And they're just asking that the Lord would intervene in that behalf. And so we want to commit that request to the Lord this morning. Cornelia uh, Sorrow, so let's remember that prayer request. I also want to pray for a lady by the name of a Mrs. Bruce. Pray that the Lord would be mindful of her situation, whatever it would be. I uh, want to pray for uh, Tara Snogris, homesick this morning, needs healing in her body. So let's remember that need. All the unspoken prayer requests, if you have a need this morning, we know that we're a, a people with many needs among us. We just committed all into the hands of the Lord. He's able to take care of every situation. Are you glad you're a Christian this morning? Somebody say praise the Lord. Brother Rob, God bless you as you come to lead us to the Lord in prayer this morning. Certainly appreciate the Weber family, don't we? Amen, buddy. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Rob. Let's pray. Dear Lord, once again, we come before you in prayer with thanksgiving in our hearts, asking for you to come and, and be welcome in this place. Thank you for your spirit, Lord. Thank you for your grace. I thank you, Lord. There, there are two requests that were made known, and they're serious things. Lord, I, I pray you stretch forth your hand to heal. I thank you, Lord. And, and so many times as we listen um, to older sermons and Brother Brandon praying for people, it's in such simplicity. He does not give long words. Lord, what do we know without you? He just comes forward and just says, Lord, Lord, come, do as, as, as you decree, do as you desire. Lord, we look for your perfect will for this service. So we ask you to stretch forth your hand. I pray, O oh God, by your grace, Lord, it is sufficient for us what you have in store. I pray that you be with the ministry, Lord, to give us what we have need of, Lord. Get us out of the way to get, us, get me out of the way in this prayer, Lord. Get me out of the way that, that, that you can speak through us, Lord, in every facet of the service. I pray, O oh God, by your by your life, Lord, be manifested this day in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. Praise the Lord. You can be seated <clears throat> just for a few minutes this morning. <clears throat> Let me make this announcement. Uh, there will be a household shower for Allison Ward and Mark McNulty. That will be next Sunday, June the 3rd at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Brothers and sisters are welcome, so remember that. That's next Sunday, June the 3rd at 6 p.m., a household shower for Sister Allison Ward, Brother Mark McNulty. That'll be in the Fellowship Hall. Now, this weekend, as you know, is Memorial. Tomorrow will be Memorial Day as we celebrate it, and just want to take a, a minute to say how much we appreciate all of our uh, great, great people that have served and that are now serving in the military. A lot of those that served gave the ultimate sacrifice, and that was their life. I saw uh, on social media where there's somebody had put on there, there's two men that died for you. That's the soldier that gave his life in battle, and Jesus Christ that died for your soul. And we appreciate, we appreciate every bit of it, don't we? We certainly do. And all, the, all of those that have given the ultimate sacrifice fighting and defending our freedom, we want to say we thank them and we appreciate their families. And all of our, our uh, veterans that are, that are present this morning, I, I'd like for you to just stand for a second if you would. All of our veterans that have served in the military, if you'd just stand just for a minute, just for a minute or two, just take the time to look around. Look around and see who all has served in our uh, military for defense of this country. Uh, we want to say this morning that we certainly appreciate you with all of our heart. God bless you. Let's give them a nice hand this morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I guess Brother, Brother Charlie Therese, you can be seated. Brother Charlie is probably the elder statesman of all the group. 90, 95 now, Brother Charlie? Is that right? 95. How about that? And still finds his place in the front seat of Happy Valley. God bless you, my buddy. I got a feeling you want to say something. Stand up, stand up and say something.
Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. But Charlie, we, we need you here. I just tell you that. We do need you here. Now we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song. Somebody say, let's sing. The rest of you join in if you will. Let's sing a song this morning. Praise the Lord. Let's sing a little song. I'm going home with Jesus in the twinkling of an eye. And Brother Charlie talking about the word predestination. Aren't you glad that you've been elected? Aren't you glad that you have been elected to believe what you're believing in this hour? You may think, well, I just I stumbled in here just to, just uh, luck of the draw. No, it wasn't. It wasn't luck. It had nothing to do with it. God put you here for a very specific reason. That's to believe the word for this hour. To be a beaming light in a dark world. I heard Brother Branham say on the tape the other day that the, the world is, is getting more groped in darkness all the time. Every day we live, it's more dark, getting more dark. But he said there's a great light that's pressing down. Light will overtake darkness any time. Do you believe that with all your heart? You're children of light. Give the Lord one more hand clap of praise if you love him. Hallelujah. Somebody say bless the Lord. Somebody say glory. I'm going home with Jesus in the twinkling of an eye. I made my preparation for a mansion in the sky. I may not know the moment and I may not know the day, but I know that I'll be leaving when he calls his bride away. Yes, I'm a going. Jesus in the twinkling of an eye. I made my preparation for a mansion in the sky. I may not know the moment and I may not know the day, but I know that I'll be leaving when he calls his bride away. I'm listening for the trumpet to sound most any time, and a crowd of life is away. This is blood of Jesus oh, The truth yes, has been has. paid for me yeah, I'm, I'm going home with Jesus In the twinkling of an eye I made my preparation For a mansion in the sky I may not know the moment Or I may not know the day But I know that I'll be leaving When he calls his bride away The captain of the vessel Destination's heaven, safe on the crystal shore. We'll meet again, the Savior, and our loved ones who've gone on to live for all eternity. Oh, yes, I'm going home. I'm going home with Jesus in the twinkling of an eye. I made my preparation for a mansion in the sky. He's calling, yes, he is. And the destination's heaven, safe on that crystal shore. We'll meet again, the Savior, and our loved ones who've gone Thank on. You, Lord. And they live for all eternity. Oh, oh, yes, God. I'm going home. I'm going home with Jesus in the twinkling of an eye. I've made my preparation. For a mansion in the sky, I may not know the moment, and I may not know the day, but I know that I'll be leaving when he calls his bride away. Yes, I'm a going home with Jesus in the twinkling of an eye. I made my preparation for a mansion in the sky. Amen. 
morning. God bless you. You can be seated this morning. We're going to sing a little chorus. And we have some folks visiting with us uh, this morning. Ushers, why don't you, they just about forgot to take the offering this morning. Ushers, come and get the offering and the tithes and offering this morning. You have to remind them all the time to do their job. Bless their hearts. <laughs> don't you look at me like that. Praise the Lord. We appreciate these guys, don't we? God bless their hearts. Amen. <clears throat> All of our visitors today, we want to say we welcome you. Glad to have you in the house of the Lord. Those that would be streaming today, we pray that uh, this service would be a great blessing to those folks as well. As I was saying, we have some visitors with us today. Brother and Sister Green from over in West Virginia. I believe that's where they live. That's Brother Brandon's mother and father. And Brother Brandon and his father, they have us some songs this morning. I don't know exactly how they have that put together. But uh, if they come on the platform at this time. <laughs> now you, you go ahead and laugh. You'll get old one day. It's coming. Just be sure it's coming. You are not to have done me that way, Brandon. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But we certainly appreciate Brother Brandon Green and his family, Sister Amy and, and the boys. We certainly do. And uh, we're so glad to have Brother and Sister Green Sr. with us this morning in the service. And uh, we're just trying our best to get them to be Carter County people. Hope that'll work out. Don't know that it will, but I hope that it will. But I want you to give Brother Brandon and his father a nice hand this morning as they get ready to sing for you. service last night. Really enjoyed the message. Um, it's so true about fear. Um, I knew as a young man God had called me to minister, but so many times we let fear be that guiding force. You know, we, I, I kind of thought, well, I may not be as good as the next guy, and uh, I may make a mistake. God said, you probably will. The devil kept saying, well, you're not worthy. The Lord said, you're right. But he said, because of the blood of Jesus Christ that was spilled, I made you worthy. So you never give a preacher that God has taken the fear away of Mike. So um, I appreciate, I'd been sick back in, the, back in the winter and early spring, and I appreciate all the prayers and about the last five or five weeks or so felt felt a lot better and uh, also just like to praise the Lord for I've got a brother that has terminal lung cancer um, started in his throat um, thought they had it cleared up went to his lungs um, a little bit over a year ago uh, but for about the last two months he's been completely off of oxygen he's off of his steroids um, they tried two medicines, and each medicine, the cancer grew each time. And finally, it come down to where they said, we don't have any other choice. We, there's no other medicine that's been proven that can help. They said, we've got two that will try. One doctor even refused to, to try. And uh, he said, well, I want to try. He's got a little nine-year-old girl. He said, whatever I, I can do. He went for a, a scan about two weeks ago. He got his report, and they said that the cancer had decreased by 50%. I don't believe it was the medicine. I believe it was the hand of God. You know, my brother had run. He had run from the Lord for many, many years. Sometimes the Lord allows tragic things to happen in our life to get us where we need to be. And so for the last four or five months he's been sitting in church he's given his life to the Lord he told me he said in February he said the battle stopped he said I give up he said so I'm okay if God takes me and it's his will he said I'm fine with that but he said I'm glad that I'm still here 
and that God has given me another opportunity to live a few more days. So I thank the Lord for that. God's still a healer. I agree with the brother. He said, the world thinks we're crazy. They do. But let me be numbered among the crazy. And I'll serve God with all of my crazy heart. Because he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy to be honored. I thank him that it's all him and none of me. The the minister said last night, he said right here, "It's it's all the Lord. It's none of us. And so I appreciate the Lord because he's been good to me. He's blessed me. Just to know him in the fellowship and the fullness of his spirit, to know God that, that he has given us what we need in this dark age. We are living in a dark age. And so I appreciate the Lord for his love and for his great mercy. I was on a mountain and wandering from the fountain when I heard my Savior speak to me. He said, come to me relenting and of your sins repenting and I will lead you out where you can see. And I'm so glad he Straight from him, no, never. For he 
I see him? Okay. I don't want to take up too much time. I'm glad to have my mom and dad here tonight, this morning. You called me from the grave by name. You called me out of all my shame. I see the old has passed away the new has come now I have resurrection power living on the inside Jesus you have given us freedom we're no longer bound by sin and darkness living in the light of your goodness you have given freedom we're dressed in all your royalty your Holy Spirit lives in me I see our past has been redeemed cause the new has come and now we have resurrection power Jesus, you have given us freedom. ago, Brother Andrew Cobb, Sister Emily, they went to South Carolina. Brother Andrew went to, went to school, and uh, Brother Jason Watkins, they started attending his church, and uh, Brother Jason just kept them. He wouldn't let them, wouldn't, I ain't going to say he wouldn't let them come home, but he strongly forced them to stay. So I think turnabout's fair play. What we want to do, Brother Jimmy, I want you to make a call after a while and call Brother Jason and tell him that Brother Matt and his family, they won't be back. We're just going to keep them here. We'll just swap. Is that all right? You appreciate Brother Matt and his family being with us this morning. Amen. Let's sing a little chorus as he gets ready to come. We'll fall down and lay our crown at the feet of Jesus. You know, Brother Brandon talking about old Moe's come to the Lord after so many years of his life, old in age, but God got a hold of his heart. 
And somebody was telling him, said, Moses, it won't be long. You'll be getting your robe and your crown. He said, don't talk, about, don't talk about a robe and a crown to me. He said, just let me stand and look at him for a thousand years. I think that'll be us. Just let us stand and look at him and magnify his precious name for a thousand years. For what he's done for us. Has he done great things for you today? Yes, he has. Amen. Let's sing that as Brother Matt Watkins gets ready to come. Bring us the word of the Lord. We'll fall down. We'll lay our crown at the feet of Jesus. bless you. Amen. So good to be here again. Amen. Amen. Appreciate the word last night. I hope that you Amen. did. Amen. Amen. I hope that it was a blessing to you and the Lord spoke to you and in some kind of way. Amen. And uh, just love the Lord. Do you? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, if you have your Bible, we'll go straight to the word. Amen. This morning. Thank you, brother. You wouldn't have a hard time getting my wife to move here. <laughs> she loves the mountains, and so, Brother Louie, that wouldn't be too hard of a sell. And you're a good salesman, but uh, it really wouldn't be too hard to sell. Amen. Amen. We always talk about that, and we're on the beach, and you guys are in the mountains, and uh, we're not beach people. We, we never go, very, very, very rarely, uh, but uh, we love coming to the mountains, amen, and love just being in the you got a beautiful place here, amen, beautiful people, amen, and we serve an awesome God, amen, amen. praise the Lord. I want to say again, it's just a privilege always to come, appreciate Brother Donnie for having us, amen, again, Ephesians chapter 6, we'll have you turn straight to the word, amen, and we just want to read starting with verse 10, starting with verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand, to stand against the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles of the devil? Good question. We're going to look at that today. 
For we wrestle not, notice this, it doesn't say that we don't wrestle, because we do. It's not what Paul's saying. He's saying we don't wrestle, we don't fight, we don't, we don't war. No, we do war, but we don't war against flesh and blood issues, or flesh and blood problems, or flesh and blood addictions. You may have addictions, people may be addicted, but the problem is not a flesh and blood issue. But we wrestle against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. You are in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance, and supplication for all saints and for me, that other utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Second Corinthians chapter two, one more scripture, and we'll have you be seated. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse eleven. We'd like to speak to you this morning on a title, Dimensional Discernment. Dimensional Discernment. Lest Satan, verse 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning. God, that you've gathered us and assembled us here again, Lord, under that name that is above every name. Lord, it's higher than any sickness, higher than any disease. Lord, that name is higher than any addiction, Lord, or problem that we could face today. Lord, so we lay all of our burdens at the feet of Jesus. This morning, Lord, you told us, cast your cares upon me, for I careth for you. So we cast them down, Lord Jesus, this morning. We lay them down, Lord, and I pray, God, that you would just come, speak word, Lord, a word of refreshment to your body. Lord, may we just be attentive to the word of God that goes forth. Lord, I pray that you would bind every evil spirit that would try to hinder the preaching of your word this morning. Lord, may you bind every evil spirit that would try to hinder the receiving of that word, Lord, and the bringing forth. I pray, God, you would be with us. Lord, in this church this morning, we ask in Jesus Christ's name, amen. You can be seated this morning. Dimensional discernment. We like to look at, and, and, and just for a few minutes here, to look at this multidimensional world that we live in. In the first part of this, we'll just be laying a foundation. So just stay uh, real attentive this morning as we'll be going through this. Uh, quickly through some scriptures and some things the prophet had to say about this. But what we need to have happen this morning, and if I could accomplish this purpose, it would be to have our spiritual eyes opened because Paul said we shouldn't be ignorant of Satan's devices. That when he speaks of devices, he's speaking that Satan has a plan or a tactic or a scheme And the prophet of God says it this way, that overcoming is recognizing the devil's tactics, to recognize the devil's schemes. And he's got a playbook that he's playing by. Just as two teams that would face each other, the one team would study the weaknesses and the strengths of the other team, and they would literally devise a plan or a playbook to exploit the areas of weakness in the other team. And Satan has devised a playbook against humanity, against God's people. And he wants to enact those plays, and he wants to enact his schemes. 
But Paul said we should have wisdom. Our spiritual eyes should be open so that we're not ignorant of Satan's tactics. We're not ignorant of his devices. Oh, no, Brother Matt, don't go there. (laughs) Paul says we're not ignorant of his devices. We're not ignorant of his tactics. But what we're speaking of when we speak on dimensional discernment is understanding that there is a kingdom, understanding the kingdom of the devil and of Satan, understanding the reality that there is angels and there is demon spirits, and that there's demons that are lurking in another world, in in another dimension that tries to influence you every day of your life. Angels both good and bad. A bad angel is called a demon spirit. That's what a demon is. It's a fallen angel. An angel has a free will. They have the ability to make a choice. Their, dis- their, their, their position that God gave them was to be a messenger. And they can have a choice to choose to deliver that message or to rebel against God. We're taught in the scripture very clearly that angels rebelled against God and against heaven. And that they left their own. Jude says that they left their first estate. They left their habitation. And those angels that were good angels created for good purposes became bad with bad intents and they become demon spirits. What the Apostle Paul is saying here in Ephesians 6 is that there's a real struggle, a real battle, a real war that's taking place. And it's not against flesh and blood. It's not a physical. What we need to understand as mature Christians today is that no matter what issue you bring up today, no matter what problem or sin or, or, or disease or addiction, that it's not a flesh and blood battle that you're facing today, but it's a spiritual battle. And it's a real battle that's really taking place right now in another dimension. Paul says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That word high places that Paul is speaking of, that is another dimension. It's it's an atmosphere that we wrestle our war, our struggle every day as a believer, as a Christian. And sometimes we can get confused and think that we're we're dealing with real sin, with, with sin that is physical, or we physically fall, or we physically say the wrong thing. But what you have to understand as a believer is that there was a spiritual influence that caused the natural response or action of doing the wrong thing that before you said the wrong thing there was a spirit in another dimension that influenced you whether you seen it or didn't see it or heard it or didn't hear it there was a spiritual action or pressure or influence that you're subjected to as a believer that causes every bad action are you with me here this morning And you may look at addictions today and you may look at a person who has a nicotine addiction or a drug addiction or a sex addiction or some addiction to popularity or money or or fashion and you may look at those things and, and think we're struggling against alcohol and if we could just defeat the alcohol, the person may be addicted uh, by, a, by a, a spirit of alcoholism. But what you have to understand is that that's not alcoholism that you're facing or you're battling, but it's a spirit, a demon spirit that for some reason that person has given access to that demon to dwell inside of their spirit and that demon builds a stronghold in that man's life and we label it alcoholism but it's a stronghold a drug addiction is a stronghold a sex addiction is a stronghold no matter what you face today and are tempted with in your flesh it is a spiritual battle taking place in an angelic dimension and you are caught in the middle of a good influence coming from above and a bad influence coming from beneath and every single day your mission is to have victory in a dimension that you can't see and that you can't feel and that you can't touch but it's taking place and the battle and the struggle is to get victory in that dimension hallelujah are you here today so we as believers need to understand that these problems are not flesh and blood issues but they're spiritual wickedness in high places 
And you could be demon possessed today in this church sitting here hearing the word of God. Yeah. You could be. And so you can find it in Jude that the scripture tells us that there's real angels. The Bible says that they kept, their, they kept not their dwelling place, but they left their own habitation. And what we realize is that the demonic world is a real world. The underworld is real. It's not some Hollywood film that they create and they create uh, evil, evil things that you see today produced by Hollywood, even just the labels and the, uh, and, and, and the images that they create. They're tapping into another dimension that is a real dimension. It's not fake. It's not man thinks that they've created this world and their imagination, and they, they, they crown them and give them uh, a prizes and awards and say, oh, you, 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 you acted so great in that film, and you played that part so well in that film. We're going to give you a, an Oscar. We're going to give you an award what they don't realize is that the ability was given by a spirit who anointed that individual and gave them an inspiration to play a part to deceive the world no matter what you look at in the news today and you read about mass shootings in a, uh, every single day, it seems like we turn on the news and there's another school shooting and someone's went up in a school and shot, the, shot uh, people and, and turns on fire alarms and as people are running outside, it's gunning people down. And you ask, what happened? Was that person just a bad apple? Did they, did they just have a messed up childhood? No, my brother, it is demonic oppression that has literally infiltrated the minds of humanity to where the the only thing that keeps an unconverted person sane is law and order and rules and regulations. But by nature, they are literally a beast by nature. And more than ever before, you're living in a world that the prophet would call an age of total neurotics. The brother Branham said, the world I prophesy will go to a place to where they go completely insane. And we're seeing the manifestation of it today. It's the, because you say, why is it, Brother Matt? Why does that happen? Because a book that they've disregarded and that they've taken out of their schools, that they've taken out of their, uh, people don't want to preach it anymore, but a book prophesied in the book of Revelation and said that the demon, the dragon, has unleashed forces and unleashed his wrath upon humanity. It was prophesied in Scripture, and it's happening before our very eyes. The scripture says that that, de- that dragon has unleashed his wrath and fury. The Bible says it this way, that Satan has poured out his wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And as the time gets shorter and shorter, he gets angrier, he gets more desperate. And what you're seeing today is desperation attempts trying everything he can to thwart the plan of God, but it won't be thwarted. No weapon formed against this church shall prosper. No tactic and no scheme that Satan wants to plan or devise or give us devices by. But God's bride will have a supernatural discernment of a dimension of another world. She'll be so on fire with the Holy Ghost and so red that there will be the, 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 the bride of Christ. Brother Branham said it this way. She'll be in the very image of Jesus Christ. Her senses will be exercised to discern both good and evil. So the scripture says, what is it? What the Bible teaches us is we just have to not get ahead of ourselves this morning. But that there's the Bible, what we understand from the scripture is that there's a real world. There's real beings called angels, intelligent creatures in the world that are supernatural beyond our human senses. And they are there all the time. I'm not just speaking of demon spirits, I'm speaking of angelic spirits also. But there's spirits all the time. What the scripture teaches, is, and Jesus, you see, dealt with these even in his earthly ministry. He deals with some of these spirits, uh, a demonic oppression, and, men, and people that were totally possessed and couldn't even speak. They were so possessed by an evil spirit. What the Bible teaches us is that there's good angels and there's bad angels. And that you as a, as a believer are literally surrounded by a spiritual host of good and wickedness at all times. And there are certain conditions that you can create 
that allow or invite the wrong spirit. And there's certain conditions that you can create that invite or allow the right spirit. That's why we don't go to certain places. Why? Because we're inviting the wrong spirit. But there are certain places that we do go, like church. Why? We're inviting the right spirit. Right? And so these bad angels are not, what we learn is they're not in some underworld or some layer or somewhere way below that if you dig far enough, you'll eventually come to the the demon's domain. The demon spirits are not in some other world or other some millions of millions of miles away. But what we learn is that they're just right here, right now, just in another dimension. And the real battle taking place right now is not happening on earth in a flesh and blood battle, but it's happening in heavenly places. Got this chart here that if the brothers can just display, it's a very busy chart and you may not be able to get too much from it. Uh, the image that, that I had displayed, the very first one. But it just goes to show some, a brother in the Philippines created it. If you ever, if you want it, you can get with me. I can get it to you. It's a great way to describe the multi-dimensional environment uh, that man lives in. Yeah, brother, you could go ahead and display that one that you got there. Yep. Uh, It 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 shows how that man lives in a multi-dimensional environment. If you can't get it, that's okay. But we as humans are subjected to this environment at all times. And this chart shows the different dimensions uh, that we have here. You notice uh, over to the, what would be your left, you have the first dimension being light, the second dimension being matter, and the third being time. And you'll see how the, the fourth dimension is this blue strip that goes from the very bottom all the way to the top. And this is that fourth dimension that interacts with all of the dimensions that exist. And that fourth dimension, Brother Branham called science. This is where television uh, exists. This is where internet, uh, uh, radio waves, uh, science always is moving within and without. Even right now as I'm speaking to you today, there is horrible images, images you would never want to see that are flashing through this room right now. There's voices that are taking place. Can you hear them? Can you see those images right now? No. No, you can't. There's ball games and sports that are taking place. And literally, there's an image going across this room right now, but you can't see them. You can't hear them. But if I take and place the right device that can tune into that dimension, you would suddenly see the images that are moving through this room. Now, they were there all the time. They didn't just suddenly appear. If I was to stick a television right here and turn it on, they wouldn't just magically appear. But they were there before I turned the TV on. The only difference was is that something, I placed something in front of you that had the ability and, and a crystal to tune in to that other dimension. Are you with me here this morning? It's the same exact way when the worship service begins to go and songs are being sang. Some people are literally existing and singing the songs of Zion in a physical dimension only, but others are tapping out of this dimension and turning a crystal in their own spirit and tapping into another dimension. And those are the ones that are really worshiping God in spirit and in truth. What is it? It's worship from another dimension. I want to be one of those worshipers. I don't just want to be trapped here in this physical world of pain and sickness and problems. But when I worship the Lord, I want to move out of this world into a world that maybe I can't see with my eyes or hear with my ears. But my spirit is tuned and synced with that dimension. Hallelujah. Then you have that fifth dimension, the underworld. Brother Branham says it this way, that right underneath this dimension... And underneath this realm of humans is the realm of the regions of the lost. And just below that is the the region of demon spirits. And he says it this way, that right below that is the very layer, our kingdom of Satan, hell itself. And then you're here caught in this realm and this light and matter and time. But just above that is the sixth dimension 
where paradise is. It's where the prophet went to. And remember, he said, I've seen real bodies, real people. I was looking back at my body laying on a bed. I was watching. What was it? He had stepped out of that dimension. He didn't go a million miles. He didn't get on a, a car or, 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 or a plane and fly somewhere. He literally changed dimensions. And there was other people who was walking healthy, without issues, without problems, without sickness, without pain. They were living real life it's just another dimension and then right above that is that seventh dimension called heaven where God dwells and what we understand through the teaching of the message is that man lives in this multi-dimensional environment and we're subject to those seven dimensions around us at all times. What we learn is that heaven and hell is not some million miles away, but it's just across the chasm. And when we die, we don't go somewhere on a trip we don't get on a plane and fly off somewhere. We don't get on some fast car and go, go off somewhere millions of miles away. But the prophet says when we die, we just change dimensions. That's it. And the only thing we take, all of our possessions stay in this dimension, but our character comes in this dimension. That's why every sermon that's preached, the Holy Spirit is trying to work on your character. He's trying to work on your spirit. He's trying to work on your life. What is it? It's the only thing valuable. Brother, you can't take that car. You can't take that house. You can't take that bank account. But here's what else you can't take. You can't take your problems. You can't take your sicknesses. You can't take that back pain over there. You can't take those headaches, that disease. You can't take it over there. The only thing over there is life, real life, real living, real joy, real happiness. Oh, somebody say praise the Lord this morning. I ain't going to take any of my troubles. But I'm not going to take some million mile journey. I'm just going to change dimensions. <laughs> As the song says, I'll speed up just a little bit. And they'll slow down. So the prophet teaches us if you're a Christian and you've been born again, when you die, you go to a place called the sixth dimension place of paradise where the dead in Christ await and goes back to being young again and to a celestial body waiting for the day when Christ shall come back to earth again in a rapture to pick up that body that you left behind. And we literally will raise our mortal body and that theophany body and mortal body will make up one body called the glorified body. We'll raise it, it'll raise from the dust of the earth to a body that's immortal and incorruptible. In a glorified body, one that's not limited. That's the body Christ wants to get you to. But if you're a sinner and you die and you missed or you didn't heed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you've rejected it, maybe you've never rejected it by saying I don't believe it or blasphemed it, but you never took the opportunity or the chance to get your life wrapped up in Christ and die from your old man and be regenerated unto a new birth by the Holy Spirit, by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And if you die in that condition, and you died without repenting of your sins, and never receiving Christ, you go to a place called the fifth dimension. There on the chart you have it. That dark place, that fifth dimension, where the souls of the wicked are imprisoned, awaiting the great white throne judgment to be judged according to the deeds done in their body. Brother Branham says it this way, and the brothers have the quote. He says, now light, matter, and time and our five senses contact them dimensions, light, matter, and time. Our sight contacts light. Our feeling contacts matter and so forth. Now, he says, but we have contact through science, the fourth dimension as it was, because coming right through this building right now comes pictures. 
voices of radio, pictures on television, that our senses does not contact that, but yet they have a tube or a crystal that picks up those ether waves and manifests them. So you see, right in this building, this is from present stage of my ministry, right in this building, right now, in this building is live actions of people in the air, live voices. They're here, we know it, they're absolutely the truth. And the only thing you do, they catch it on. I don't understand the mechanics of those things that science has invented, but we know that it proves to us there is a fourth dimension. Now, the fifth dimension is where the sinner goes. The fifth dimension is the kind of, well, the horrible dimension. Now, this man, when a Christian dies, he goes into the sixth dimension, and God is in the seventh dimension. Now, then you see, the Christian, when he dies, he goes under the altar of God, right into the presence of God, hallelujah, under the altar, and he's at rest. To break it down, when a man has a nightmare, he's not altogether asleep, neither is he awake. He's between sleep and awake. And that's what makes him have a horrible shaking and screaming because he's not asleep, he's not awake, and to take that, it shows where a man goes when he dies unconverted. He's lived his time up. He's dead on earth, and he cannot go into the presence of God because he's not fit to go there without the blood. He's caught. My goodness. He's caught. He can't come back to earth because his time's finished here on earth. He's caught between. He's in a nightmare. See, he can't go in the presence of God to rest. He can't come back, come to earth because his time's up. He's in a nightmare. And there he stays until the day of judgment, a horrible thing to be in. And now in this vision, I believe I was caught to that sixth dimension. Looking back down here, I could see back. See, sight isn't exactly with the eyes that's earthly, but sight is a greater thing than that. The sight that they have there, their contact is far beyond any contact that our natural senses would contact. So what is this other dimension? It's another place. It's another world. It really exists right now. The only difference is is that you don't have the tool or the crystal to tune in to be able to see with your two eyes that other dimension. But it's there all the time. It's there all the time. No matter uh, what you see or what you feel. Or maybe you say, "I I can't see it today. But it's here right now. The fourth dimension proves that. That even right now there's voices, there's people, there's images. The Brother Branham says that there's actions moving right through this room right now. And if you take the right instrument, it tunes into that other dimension. And God sent a prophet who had an instrument to where he could see past what you see with your own two eyes. And he could peer into another world or another dimension and then use his voice to try to describe it. And we use our imagination as we try to imagine it. But it's a real place. Jesus dealt with this even in his ministry. You notice some of these spirits. The Bible says in Matthew 4, 24, his fame went throughout all Syria. They brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had the palsy and he healed them. Let's turn over to Mark chapter 5 quickly. If you have your Bible, I didn't, I didn't give you this, uh, brother, so if you just want to stay right there. If you have your Bible, uh, let's turn there today. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. They came over onto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadareans. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him a man. Immediately uh, met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been oft bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. 
Always day and night he was in the mountains, in the tombs, crying, cutting himself with stones. But when he saw, notice who he's talking about, he's not referring to legion, because legion is the spirit, the name of the demon spirits that are, that are possessing the man. He's speaking about the man. Are you with me? Notice what he says. He says, and who had his dwelling among the tombs, and, 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 and verse, verse five, and always day and night he was in the mountains, verse six, but when he, who, he, this man, the man before he was possessed, before he had demon spirits, he was a good man. He had good intentions. Maybe he came to church. He wanted to serve God. He was a good person in his heart, in his core. He was a good individual. He didn't start off bound. And the scripture says in verse 6, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. What was it? And he cried with a loud voice. Now what happens? Now you see the difference between humanity and an angelic world because the man is going to worship, but the spirit is going to despise and speak against Jesus. Verse 7, and he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. It's almost an oxymoron. In verse 6, he's worshiping. In verse 7, he's cursing him. Now, this man didn't start off this way. This man started off a good man. Bondage and chains that he had physically, the chains that you could physically see, they didn't start there. But what started was chains in his spirit and chains in his mind as he fed on that addiction and he fed on that spirit and he fed on the wrong thing and he watched the wrong thing, he said the wrong thing and he refused to heed the voice of God. And eventually that spirit literally possessed his body. He was literally possessed by a demon spirit. Notice what it says here. Do you realize that? That when you become possessed by a demon spirit, it's the same when you receive the Holy Ghost. What is receiving the Holy Ghost? It is the spirit of God literally possessing your body. And you are possessed. You say, do we have any possessed people here today? I hope we do. I consider myself to be possessed. I consider myself to be possessed of a Holy Spirit, a spirit that literally has possessed the body and takes control of my actions and takes control of my voice and my mouth and what I think and where I go and what I say. Why do you live the way you live? Because there's a spirit that is possessing you. I want to be possessed. Come out of the man. Notice what he says here. Verse 8, Jesus says, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? He answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. He besought him that much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was nigh uh, unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000. How do you get to the place to where you're bound by 2,000 demon spirits? Because you give heed to one, you allow one, and then another, once you allow one, it's just a, a domino effect. Amen. The next and 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 the next to where you're totally bound. And you become like Legion was, a social reject. No one wanted to be around him. He was angry all the time. You never knew why. He had anger and, and wrath and he was always upset. Maybe it started with just a temper and he said the wrong thing. And that spirit, that voice that came to him to try to correct him and said, make that right. You shouldn't have spoke to her that way. You shouldn't have spoke to your children that way. But pride kept him from repenting. And he held that anger in. That's why the Bible says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Make it right. Don't let the devil have a place. 
But he continued to give him place and continued to feed and feed and feed on the addiction and feed on the addiction. Coming to church looked fine. Everybody thought he was a good believer. No issues, no problems. But inwardly, there's a spirit, a lion that is consuming his body, consuming his mind, consuming his thoughts, consuming everything he does. And he never brings it subject to the Holy Ghost. Say that cannot happen to me, it can happen to any one of us. The Bible says that he, verse 14, and they that fed the swine told the city in the country, and they went out into the sea. Where did this evil begin? We gotta, we gotta move past this just for a moment. We've got, he says, where does, it, where does evil come from? You say, well, well, did it come from man? It didn't come from man. When God created man, God said, it's good. It's a good creation. Man is not evil within the creation of man. It didn't come from nature. Nature is under a curse. Nature was originally good. But where did it originate from? Let's find out. Notice Ezekiel chapter 28. Turn in your Bible. I didn't send this back, so let's, let's use our Bible today. Amen. Let's hear the rustling of those leaves this morning. Turn in Ezekiel chapter 28. We're going to look at where, excuse me, we're going to look at where evil came from, where it originated from. Ezekiel 28, verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God, thou Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. Verse 12, son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Say unto him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. What's he talking about here? Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. That's the origination of evil. And they try to figure out in science where does morals come from, where does evil come from. They've, they've tried to sit under experiments and research and doctors and, and scientists looked at it. All they got to do is turn to Ezekiel. you find it right here. This is where it started, the very beginning. The seed started in Lucifer. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut to the ground which did weaken the nations? For had thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shall, here's what God says, and all your boasting and all your boasting that you want to boast and say, I'm going to be this and I'm going to be that. God says, yet thou shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that shall see thee shall look narrow, shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee saying, is this? You know what you're going to do when you see the devil? You're going to go, that little that little peon, that little shrimp, that little, that little, oh, that's who bothered me, my, that's who I was, that's who was bothering my family, that's who I was so intimidated by when the doctor gave me a bad report, that's who I was so nervous and fearful of, 
The Bible says they'll look upon him narrowly saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble and that did shake the kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroy the cities thereof, that opened not the house of the prisoners. That's why the brother Branham says he's just a bluff. He's just a liar. He's just a bluff. Oh, Satan, we're here to expose you today. You, you think you've been hiding long enough, but God's family is going to expose you in their lives? I want to say like Jesus, you have no part in me. You have no part in my family. You have no place in my mind. Hallelujah. Notice what it says about this man in Revelation 12, verse 4. And his tail, his tail, the dragon. This is what Satan does. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. He deceives a third part of heaven. Who do you think you face every single day of your life? Fallen angels. Rebellious spirits started in hell. Yeah. Rebellious spirits started in hell. That's why the Bible equates it to this sin of witchcraft. Are you here today? Yeah, we better not go down that, that, that alley. We'll get lost. The Bible says that a third of heaven, it would mean, how many is that? I don't know. But I guess it would be millions of demon spirits that have been unleashed upon the earth. Millions of spirits. Uh, Notice what the prophet of God says here. He says in the message, and brothers, you have this in the message, proof of his resurrection. Now the same thing is wrong with you is wrong with that woman sitting yonder. Notice this. The same thing wrong with you, he points to a woman, is the same thing wrong with that woman sitting over yonder looking right at me on the end of the row. Right out there with a little round hat on, there's a dark string. A dark string. Now notice, no one's seen it, but a prophet was there and he looked into another dimension. And there was a string going from that lady all the way over the audience, attaching to this lady over here. There's a dark string, the lady looking across this lady's head, looking at me right here with her hand up. That's it, lady. That's right. Here it is. Coming from one to the other, it's evil powers pulling a dark streak. Yeah. Do you realize when you're in church and you have a spirit of doubt, that spirit of doubt can jump on somebody else? who was not doubting before, but suddenly they're afflicted with doubt, trying to hear the word of God, and it started because you gave the devil place in your mind. But the very same opposite effect can happen when you start to pull on the word of God, and you start letting go of that oppression and depression. Somebody else that's afflicted with depression suddenly has the power to let go. They don't realize it's happening in another dimension somewhere. That's why it's important that we pull on the word of God. Even if you don't feel like you need it today, pull for someone else and say, God, set them free this morning. Let them be free of that spirit. Let them be free of that oppression. Let them be free of that addiction, Lord. Let the powers of hell be cast aside and let Christ come into the building today. It's evil powers pulling a dark streak. He says in darkest hour, Jesus comes. Now here's two spirits calling one to another. I only wish that my lovely audience could only be in this dimension and see this. This woman standing here is suffering with the same thing that that woman sitting there with her hands crossed like that. Here's a dark line. Sees it again. Because the spirit that's on this woman is calling to the spirit for help. Just like Legion. Why did you come to torment me? Why did you come to torment us? What have I to do with thee, Jesus? Son of uh, God of the Most High. What have I to do with thee, Jesus? What is it? The man wants to worship God, but the spirit that is possessing him is resisting the word of God. 
in so much that he literally thinks that Jesus is there to torment him. Do you realize that's what Satan can do to some people who are in so much need of God? They're in so much need of the word of God to come and set them free. Yet they sit there with their arms crossed and folded and they think the preacher's there just to torment them or to make them mad or to pick on them. When it was the opposite, Jesus was there to set them free. He was there to set them free of that problem. Don't let the devil tell you that the preaching of the word is trying to torment you or trying to pick on you. It's here to set you free today. It's here to break every chain in your life today. He says, oh, I wish my lovely audience could only be in this dimension and see this. This woman standing here is suffering with the same thing. That woman sitting there with her hands crossed right like that. There's a dark line. Because the spirit that's on this woman is calling to this spirit for help. And it's both the same disease. Arthritis to both. And if you listen to the tape, the women start screaming and God sets both of them free. Though only one of them came to the altar to be prayed for. Because a person tuned, oh, hallelujah. Because there was a person who had the ability to peer into another dimension and expose not just the spirit on this lady, but to expose it in the audience. And when the devil is exposed, he only has one choice, and that's to run for his life. He only has one option when he's exposed. That's to call for help and go running like a coward because that's what he is. But God set them both free because God delivers and God saves and God heals. You say, can he do it for me? He can do it for you right now under the preaching of the word of God. He can set you free in your seat right now where you sit. Hallelujah. What if I told you that your heart trouble can be made well in Jesus' name? Do you believe it? He says to the woman on the stage, do you believe it? Then go. Woman starts to walk on the stage as you, hold, hold, just a moment, just a minute. Prophet says, demon screamed. What happened? This woman, Brother Brandon, simply has her in the prayer line. She's coming before. Do you believe Jesus Christ can? Okay, then go ahead. The woman starts to walk off the stage. Brother Brandon starts to go to another person and says, hold on. Hold on just a minute. A demon just screamed. You believe it? He says, demons scream. Something called for help. Demon power. It come from the audience. When this woman was healed, That demon spirit screaming to one another for help. It's the spiritual world. We're not talking about the the outside. It's the spiritual friends. They're just as real as you're real. And I see them many times when they leave. I've seen them leave right from this platform. I've seen them, some of them in the shape of bats. Look like long hairs hanging on their legs. But when you came up here and you watched that person come and get prayed for and they raised their hands and the preacher bowed down and kneeled down and prayed with him, you didn't see anything. But in another world, Satan has been defeated. That person has been set free and that spirit's looking and calling for help and running for his life. Look like long hairs hanging out, but an epileptic demon looks like a tortoise with round legs hanging up like that usually. But usually a demon of oppression seems to be more of a cloud form, like a wave. And it just makes a real funny sound when you're in that other dimension to see the spirit. You see how important it is to have discernment of that dimension. If I can get you accomplish one thing here today, it'll be this, to make you understand this is a real world. These are real demon spirits that can really possess you and attack you. And it's important more than ever before that we realize that we need to have our senses exercised to discern both good and evil to be mature Christians, to understand we're not dealing with flesh and blood here. We're dealing with spiritual wickedness in high places. You may think that's wrong, but some of these days you'll realize if you could only take a spiritual looking glass and look into your soul, you doubt 
and you'd find out what it looks like, and the greatest devil, the chief of all devils, that's got to be pornography or, or, or murder or rape or molestation or some kind of horrible. No. The prophet says the chief of all devils is unbelief. The chief, the captain, the chief, the leader, the main one, the main, the biggest, the greatest is unbelief. Why do you think more than, more than any other spirit that we face at the closing scenes of history is Satan trying to get people to disbelieve the word of God? Because he's the chief of all devils. And he affects you, he affects me, he affects our children, he affects our family, trying to get us to doubt the word of God. Are you here this today? And these angels that afflict and Satan's scheme has been thoroughly uh, written about in the scripture, his plan and his blueprint. More than ever before, he's attacking like a roaring lion. The scripture calls him uh, a roaring lion. Uh, Our adversary is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You say, Brother Matt, what does the demons want to do? What is their purpose? Do they have a purpose? They do. A demon spirit wants to deceive you until your thinking is so crooked and you look at things so backwards until you can't see straight, until you can't see the truth. The demon spirit wants to delude your mind from what's right and twist you and destroy you either physically, mentally, emotionally, or socially. Person, Satan wants more than ever before to make you a hermit. to go into your four and no more. You think fellowship is not important? You're you're, you're mistaken. Think you could just come to a church and go home and be with your family and don't have anything to do with anybody anywhere? There's a spirit trying to lead you. There's a spirit trying to do that to you, trying to separate you from everybody else. He wants to make you like Legion to push you away from society. Legion literally lived by himself, couldn't be around anybody. Or he'll destroy you. If he can't get you that way, he'll destroy you spiritually. The scripture talks about this leader of the demons, the person that we call the devil. We call him the devil. Generic name, just the devil. That was just the devil. The devil made me do it. Well, the scripture gives this devil five names and 24 titles in just the New Testament alone. This powerful angel, what the scripture calls him, the anointed cherub. The anointed cherub means he was closest to the throne of God. See, you can be closest to the throne of God and still rebel. The scripture calls him in the Bible, here's his names, Satan, Abaddon. In Greek, that about a name means Apollyon, means destroyer. Another name given to him is Beelzebub. Another name given in the Bible is Belial. And in another place, they call him Lucifer. There is nothing sweet or tender or kind about any of those names. Did you just feel a sweet spirit when I say that? Lucifer. Oh, just melts my heart. Just does something to me. Beelzebub. But what about when I say Jesus? (laughs) Emmanuel. Does it do something to you? You can just feel that gentle spirit, Jesus. That's why it's important to say his name. He shall be called Prince of Peace. He's called Everlasting Father. 
He's called son of the morning. He's called the lily of the valley. Oh, I love him, don't you? He's typed as different animals in the scripture. In the Bible, the Bible refers to him as a serpent, a snake in the grass, a red dragon, cruel and powerful. He's described in the New Testament as a prowling lion. Do you realize when you go out of church today and you walk out those doors, there's a prowling lion following behind you? Let me ask you, if, if you've turned on the news today in Happy Valley, Elizabeth, and whatever your newspaper is or however you follow your news here, and there was a picture of a lion prowling the streets of Elizabethan, and they couldn't find it, and the news article was a lion on the loose. How many of y'all would be going downtown to Elizabethan today with your children and your families? And if you were forced to go in public, would you just be sort of just walking around casually, not really care if you're watching or looking? No. But do you realize this is the reality that the scripture gives you? That in this atmosphere, in this dimension, there's a prowling lion on the loose trying to devour you? That's why Paul said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. He's called the ruler of this world, the prince of this world. Jesus calls him the God of this world. You know, he's the only person Jesus ever called God. It's out of his father, the God of this evil age. We'd like to look at something today, and it's going to, just, it's going to be lengthy. Brothers, if you'll go ahead and pull up that article. Felt led to read this. I want you to look at one of the schemes of the devil just as we close. Just give me, can I have just about 15, 20 more minutes? I want you to look at just some of the, some, this article that I found. Believe the Lord led me to it, uh, and I read it to our church, and it's, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be quite shocking. I, I don't think I'll have any trouble keeping anyone's attention, and you'll see why when we begin to read it. But the scripture says, we're not ignorant of his devices. Is that what your Bible says? I want you to read from this children's psychologist today as he wrote this article called The Undoing of Families and the uh, social media's attack and assault on young people. He says here, uh, my practice as a child, adolescent psychologist is filled with families like Kelly's. These parents say their kids extreme overuse of phones, video games, social media is the most difficult pairing issue they face. And in many cases, it's tearing families apart. Preteen and teen girls refuse to get off their phones even though it's remarkably clear the devices are making them miserable. I also see far too many boys whose gaming obsessions lead them to forego interest in school, extracurricular activities, and anything else productive. Some of these boys, as they reach their later teens, use their large bodies to terrorize parents who attempt to set gaming limits. Common thread running through many of these cases is parent guilt as, as so many are certain they did something to put their kids on a destructive path. Now listen close here. What none of these parents understand is that their children's and teens' obstructive obsession with technology is the predictable consequence of a virtually unrecognized merger between the tech industry and psychology. This alliance pairs the consumer, the consumer tech industry's immense wealth with the most sophisticated psychological research, making it possible to develop social media, video games, and phones with drug-like powers to seduce young users. These parents have no idea that lurking behind their kids' screens and phones are a multitude of psychologists, neuroscientists, and social science ex experts who use their knowledge of psychological vulnerabilities to devise products that capture kids' attentions for the sake of industry profit. What these parents and most of the world have yet to grasp is that psychology, a discipline that we associate with healing, is now being used as a weapon against children. Nestled in an unremarkable building on the Stanford University campus in Palo Alto, California, is the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab. Notice the word, 
persuasive technology. Founded in 1998, the lab's creator, Dr. B.J. Fogg, is a psychologist and the father of persuasive technology, a discipline in which digital media and apps, including smartphones, social media, and video games, are configured to alter human thoughts and behaviors as the lab's website boldly proclaims machines designed to change humans. Fogg speaks openly of the ability to use smartphones and other digital devices to change your ideas and actions. Quote, we can now create machines that can change what people think and what people do, and the machines can do that autonomously. Called the millionaire maker, Fogg, this man, has groomed former students who have used his methods to develop technologies that now consume kids' lives. As he recently touted on his personal website, my students often do groundbreaking projects and they continue having impact in the real world after they leave Stanford. For example, Instagram has influenced the behavior of over 800 million people and the co-founder was a student of mine. Intriguingly, there are signs that Fogg is feeling the heat from recent scrutiny, the use of digital devices to alter behavior. His boast about Instagram was present on his website as late of January 2018 has been removed. Fogg's, web, Fogg's website also has lately undergone a substantial makeover as he now seems to go out of his way to suggest his work has benevolent aims. Move on down, brother, uh, just, just to the to, uh, slide later. While Fogg emphasizes persuasive design's sunny future, he is quite indifferent to the disturbing reality now that hidden influence techniques are being used by the tech industry to hook and exploit users for profit. His enthusiastic vision also conveniently neglects to include how this generation of children and teens with their highly malleable minds is being manipulated and hurt by unseen forces. He calls this section weaponizing persuasion. If you haven't heard of persuasive technology, that's no accident. Tech corporations would prefer it to remain in the shadows as most of us don't want to be controlled and have a special aversion to kids being manipulated for profit. Persuasive technology, also called persuasive design, works by deliberately creating digital environments that users feel fulfill their basic human drives to be social or to obtain goals. Better than real world alternatives, kids spend countless hours in social media and video game environments in pursuit of likes, friends, game points, levels, because it's stimulating. They believe this makes them happy and successful and they find it easier than doing the difficult but developmentally important activities of childhood. While persuasion techniques work well on adults, they are particularly effective at influencing the still maturing child and teen brain. Video games, better than anything else in our culture, deliver rewards to people, especially teenage boys, says Fogg. Teenage boys are wired to seek competency, to master our world and get better at stuff. Video games and dishing out rewards can convey to people that their competency is growing. You can get better at something second by second. I'm just, I'm just leveling up. Just got to get to the next level. You think it's an accident? It's not. And it's persuasive design that's helped convince this generation of boys they are gaining competency by spending countless hours on game sites when the sad reality is that they're actually just locked away in their rooms gaming. Ignoring school and not developing the real world competencies that colleges and employers demand. Now this man only sees this from a psychologist's view I want you to put on your spiritual thinking caps this morning and see the spiritual implications of this. Likewise, social media companies use persuasive design to prey on the age-appropriate desire for pre-teens and teen kids, especially girls, to be socially successful. This drive is built into our DNA since real-world relational skills have fostered human evolution. 
The Huffington Post article, What Really Happens on a Teen Girl's Phone, describes the life of 14-year-old Casey from Milburn, New Jersey, with 580 friends on Instagram and 1,110 on Facebook. She's preoccupied with the number of likes her Facebook profile picture receives compared with her peers. As she says, if you don't get 100 likes, you make other people share it so you get 100 or else you get upset. Everyone wants to get the most likes. It's like a popularity contest. Article author Bianca Bosker says that there are costs to Casey's phone obsession. Nothing that the girl's phone, be it on Facebook, Instagram, or iMessage, is constantly pulling her away from her homework, sleep, conversations with her family. Casey says she wishes she could put her phone down, but she can't. I'll wake up in the morning and go on Facebook just because. No, it's not just because. It's because there's a, there's a psychologist in neuroscience who has designed something. You think you're just looking in a screen. What you don't see behind that app is an addiction happening. It's not like I want to or don't. I just go on and I'm like forced to. I don't know why. I need to. Facebook takes up my whole life. BJ Fogg may not be a household name, but Fortune Magazine calls him the new guru. You should know. And his research is driving a worldwide legion of user experience, UX designers, who utilize and expand upon his models of persuasive design. As Forbes magazine writer Anthony Wee Coster notes, no one has perhaps been as influential on the current generation of user experience designers as Stanford researcher B.J. Fogg. UX designers come from many disciplines, including psychology, as well as brain and computer sciences. However, the core of some UX research is about using psychology to take advantage of our human vulnerabilities. That's particularly pernicious when the targets are children. As Fogg is quoted in Costner's Forms article, Facebook, Twitter, Google, you name it, these companies have been using computers to influence our behavior. However, the driving force behind behavior change isn't computer. The missing link isn't technology, it's psychology, says Fogg. UX researchers not only often follow Fogg's model, but some may also share his apparent tendency to overlook the broader implications of persuasive design. They focus on the task at hand, building digital machines and apps that better demand users' attention, compel users to return again and again, and grow business bottom lines. Letter less considered can be how the world's children are affected by thousands of UX designers working simultaneously to pull them onto a multitude of digital devices and products at the expense of real life. According to B.J. Fogg, the Fogg behavioral model is a well-tested method to change behavior and in its simplified form involves three primary factors, motivation, ability, and triggers. Describing how his formula is effective at getting people to use social network, the psychologist says in an academic paper that a key motivator is users' desire for social acceptance. Although he says an even more powerful motivator is the desire to avoid being socially rejected. Regarding ability, Fogg suggests that digital products should be made so that users don't have to think hard. Hence, social networks are designed for ease of use. Finally, Fogg says that potential users need to be triggered to use a site. This is accomplished by a myriad of digital tricks, including the sending of incessant notifications, urging users to view friends' pictures and connect your app out to our... Notice what he's trying to do. Always notifications. You ever notice your phone? Look at my phone today. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight just on my phone right now. And you know what that causes? It causes an autopilot to when I get done preaching and I get done praying and I get back to my car and start my engine, the first thing I do. <laughs> telling them that they're missing out. It's what it's trying to do to tell you you're missing, you're missing it, you're missing it, you're missing it, you better get to it. Some people can't even avoid it in church. <laughs> Preachers preach and phone vibrates. Right. Uh -huh. Amen, brother. You preach it. 
<laughs> Telling them they're missing out while not on the social network or suggesting that they check yet again to see if anyone liked their post or photo. Folks, formula is the blueprint for building multi-billion dollar, multi dollar social media and gaming companies. However, moral questions about the impact of turning persuasive techniques on children and teens are not being asked. For example, should the fear of social rejection be used to compel kids to compulsively use social media? Is it okay to lure kids away from school tasks that demand a strong mental effort so they can spend their lives on social networks or playing video games that don't make them much at all? And is it okay to incessantly trigger kids to use revenue producing digital products at the expense of engaging with family and other real important life activities? Prophet of God prophesied, said the family's in trouble. You know why the church is in trouble? You know why the church is in trouble? Because the family's in trouble. And the church is made up of the families. And the families are made up of how much value you have one with another. He says, Daddy's at the, at the ball, at the, at the pool hall. Mama's at the stitch and sew. Johnny's driving his hot rod. The family's in trouble, separated. Are you with me? Persuasive technologies work because of their apparent triggering of the release of dopamine. Notice. A powerful neurotransmitter involved in reward, attention, and addiction. In the Venice region of Los Angeles, now dubbed Silicon Beach, the startup Dopamine Labs boasts about its use of persuasive techniques to increase profits. Connect your app to our persuasive AI and lift your engagement and revenue up 30% by giving your users our perfect burst of dopamine. A burst of dopamine doesn't just feel good, it's proven to rewire user behavior and habits. Ramsey Brown, the founder of Dopamine Lab, says in a KQED science article, we have now developed a rigorous technology of the human mind, and that is both exciting and terrifying. We have the ability to twiddle some knobs in a machine learning dashboard we build, and around the world, hundreds of thousands of people are going to quietly change their behavior in ways that unbeknownst to them feel second nature, but are really by design. Programmers call this brain hacking. As it compels users to spend more time on sites even though they mistakenly believe it's strictly due to their own conscious choice. Social networks and video games. Should I, you want me to stop? Should I stop? <laughs> Same response I got from my church. They said, no, don't stop, keep reading. Why? Because it hits home. You know what I'm doing right now? I'm hitting a funny bone. You know, you hit your funny bone, it gets your attention, don't it? It makes you realize how wrapped up we are in the World Wide Web. How wrapped up and wrapped up Satan wants to wrap our families up. Social networks and video games use the, use the trusted brain manipulation techniques of variable reward think slot machine. Users never know when they will get the next like or game reward, and it's delivered at the perfect time to foster maximal stimulation and keep them on that site. Banks of computers employ AI to learn which of a countless number of persuasive design elements will keep users hooked. A, persuasive, a persuasion profile of a particular user's unique vulnerabilities is developed in real time and exploited to keep users on the site and make them return again and again for longer periods of time. This drives up profits for consumer and internet companies whose revenue is based on how much their products are used. Clandestine techniques that manipulate users to fulfill a profit motive are regarded by programmers as dark design. Why would researchers, why would firms resort to such tactics? As former tech executive Bill Davidall says in his Atlantic article exploiting the neuroscience of internet addiction, the leaders of internet companies face an interesting if also morally questionable, questionable imperative. Either they hijack neuroscience to gain market share and make large profits or they let competitors do that and run away with the market. There are few industries as cutthroat and unregulated as Silicon Valley. 
social media and video game companies believe they are compelled to use persuasive technology in the, in the arms race for attention, profits, and survival. Children's well-being is not part of the decision's calculus. While social media and video game companies have been surprisingly successful at hiding their use of persuasive design from the public, one breakthrough occurred in 2017 when Facebook documents were leaked to the Australian. The internal report crafted by Facebook executives showed the social network boasting to advertisers that by monitoring posts, interactions, and photos in real time, the network is able to track when teens feel insecure, worthless, stressed, useless, and a failure. Why would the social network do this? The report also bragged about Facebook's ability to micro-target ads down to the moments when young people need a confidence boost. And these neuroscientists and psychologists think that they're so intelligent and so smart. What they don't see is that in another dimension there's a smart devil and smart demons who is anointing their minds and hands and ideas when they write ideas on paper. Who do you think is the master of targeting and micro-targeting temptations just at the right time? That temptation that lures you comes at the very right moment. Persuasive technology, the use of digital media, I'm almost done. Digital media to target children, deploying the weapon of psychological manipulation at just the right moment is what makes it so powerful. These design techniques provide tech corporations a window into kids' hearts and minds to measure their particular vulnerabilities, which can then be used to control their behavior as consumers. This isn't some strange future. This is now. Facebook claimed the leak report was misrepresenting the press, but when child advocates called on the social network to release it, the company refused to do so, preferring to keep the techniques it uses to influence kids shrouded in secrecy. The official tech industry's line is that persuasive technology or, or technologies are used to make pro products more engaging and enjoyable, but the revelations of industry insiders can reveal darker motives. Video game developer John Hobson, who has a PhD in behavioral and brain science, wrote the paper, paper, Behavioral Game Design. He describes the use of design features to alter video game player behavior, sounding much like an experiment, an experimenter running lab animals through their paces, answering questions such as how do we make players maintain a high, consistent rate of activity, and how to make players play forever. Now one of the most popular video games that's being played right now on Xbox and placed. Brother Matt, are you preaching against video games? I mean, that's not what I'm doing here today. If you think I am, you've missed it. And sorry if you got excited and you have something against video games and you thought I was. I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to get you to have dimensional discernment. One of the most popular video games that, is, that his kids are playing right now, the graphics... They used to think it was all about graphics. Get it more real and more real and more real. The most popular video game being played right now, I won't even give it a mention, but you teenagers know what I'm talking about. Graphics aren't even that special. Graphics really aren't that great. But yet people want to play it more than ever before because there's a neuroscience, there's, a, there's an addiction of persuasion to get you to perform and you're getting better and you're getting better and you're getting better. Oh, I'll read it from down here if I need to. I'll bring my laptop down here. No one will have to see my face. These video game developers are asking, how do we make players play forever? Revealing the hard science behind persuasive technology, Hobson says, this is not to say that players are the same as rats but that there are general rules of learning which apply equally to both. After pinning the paper, Hobson was hired by Microsoft where he helped lead the development of the Xbox Live, Microsoft's online gaming system. He also assisted in the development of Xbox, game, Xbox games popular with kids, including these in the Halo series. The parents I work with simply have no idea about the immense amount of financial and psychological firepower aimed at their children to keep them playing video games forever. 
That's why you don't just give your child a, a video game and say, just get whatever you want, play anything you want. I really don't care. Do you really not care? Do you really, really, do you really not care? Do parents not care anymore? Do you realize you're releasing that child and let them shut their door and lock themselves away and they're in a room with psychologists and neuroscience and perverted minds and with demon spirits? Hallelujah. And they're trying to destroy everything you're trying to build. They're trying to tear everything you try to do down. Hallelujah. <laughs> You okay? He says here, the official tech line, the official tech industry's line is that persuasive technologies are used. Uh, let, let, me, let me find my place again where I was. He says that the parents I work with simply have no idea the immense amount of financial, psychological firepower aimed at their children to keep them playing video games forever. Another persuasive technology expert is Bill Fulton, a game designer who trained in, who's trained in cognitive and quantitative psychology. He started Microsoft's games user research group before founding his own consulting agency. Fulton is a transparent Fulton is transparent about the power of persuasive design and the intent of the gaming industry, disclosing in big four accounting firms, P PwC's Tech Business Journal, if game designers are going to pull a person away from every other voluntary social activity or hobby or pastime, they're going to have to engage that person at a very deep level in every possible way they can. This is a major effect of persuasive design today, building video games and social media products so compelling that they pull users away from the real world to spend their lives in for-profit domains. But to engage in a pursuit at the expense of important real-world activities is a core element of addiction. And there is increasing evidence that persuasive design has now become so potent that it is capable of contributing to video game and internet addiction. Diagnoses that are officially recognized in China, South Korea, and Japan, and which are now under consideration in the United States. An addiction to the internet. An addiction to video games. You think you're not living in Satan's Eden? You are. Not only does persuasive design appear to drive kids' addictions to devices, but knowledge of addiction is used to make persuasive design more effective at hijacking the mind. As Dopamine Labs' Ramsey Brown acknowledges in the episode of CBS's 60 Minutes, since we figured to some extent how these pieces of the brain that handle addiction are working, people have figured out how to juice them further and how to bake that information into apps. The creation of digital products with drug-like effects that are able to pull a person away from engaging in real life activities and is the reason why persuasive technology is profoundly destructive. Today, persuasive design is like distracting adults from driving safely, productive work, and engaging with their own children, all matters which need a urgent attention. Still, because the child and adolescent brain is more easily controlled than the adult mind, the use of persuasive design is having a much more hurtful impact on kids. Persuasive technologies are reshaping childhood, luring kids away from family, social work, schoolwork, and spend more time, uh, more and more of their lives sitting before screens and phones. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation report, younger U.S. children now spend five and a half hours each day with entertainment technologies, including video games, social media, and online videos. Even more, the average teen now spends an incredible eight hours a day playing with screens and phones. Products, productive uses of technology where persuasive design is much less a factor are almost an afterthought as U.S. kids only spend 16 minutes each day using the computer for home or school. How much time do they spend reading their Bible? How much time do they spend at the family altar? How much time do they spend listening to the message? And we wonder why we're losing our kids. We blame it on the pastor, and we blame it on the preacher, and we blame it on the message. Oh, man, we're in some deep water. <laughs> yeah. Really hits home, don't it? Yes, sir. 
The combined effects of the displacement of vital childhood activities and exposure to unhealthy online environment. This is the very last one that I sent you, brother. A wired generation falling apart. One of the last ones. The combined effects of, dis, of the displacement of vital childhood activities and exposure to unhealthy online environments is wrecking a generation. In her recent Atlantic article, Have Smartphones Destroyed a Generation, Dr. Jean Twinge, a professor of psychology at San Diego University, describes how long hours spent on smartphones and social media are driving teen girls in the U.S. to experience high rates of depression and suicidal behavior. You say, Brother Matt, are you preaching against video games? Not what I'm doing. You preaching against phones? No. Obviously not what I'm doing. Guilty if that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to get you to understand that there's another dimension. And that there's another world. And us as believers more than ever before need to have our senses exercised to discern another dimension, to realize that there are certain conditions we can create in our home that invite the wrong spirit. There are certain things we can watch in our home that invite the wrong spirit. There are certain places that we can go that invite the wrong spirit. There are certain things we can play and watch and, and take part of and have on our phones that invite the wrong spirit. But there's the right things you can place before your children and before their eyes that create the right spirit. I want to create the right spirit in my home. I want to say, God, let me, be, let me discern that there's another dimension and there's a Holy Ghost that can really influence my children and influence my family and influence their decisions. It's called the token and I can apply it to my home in so much that it affects the very minds of my children, the influences of their behavior. I want them to be influenced from above. How many people here today want to say, Lord, let me be influenced from above. Let me discern another dimension where you can influence my behavior. You can change my behavior. Your word, you know what this word does? It's persuasive design. It persuades you to live right. It persuades you to talk right. It persuades you to go right. It persuades you to live right. Why? Because it's designed to give you strength. It's designed to give you faith. It's designed to give you hope. If you just feed upon it today oh stand to your feet and rejoice this morning hallelujah oh glory to God praise you Lord Jesus hallelujah say brother Matt what do I, I, want, I want to get questions and emails after I leave here What are we trying to do? We're trying to get you to understand there's a real world and he wants your mind. Those demon spirits want to wreck you and twist you spiritually, physically, emotionally, anoint you. They want to possess you. But you know what? There's a Holy Spirit that's here and he wants to possess you this morning. How many want to be possessed by that spirit? How many want to say, Lord, give me discernment? Let me understand, I'm not wrestling against flesh and blood. Addictions that happen in my family or my life or my children or my loved ones, that's not a flesh and blood problem. It's a spiritual wickedness in high places. That's why we preach against how you, that's why we preach how you dress, because it carries spirits. That's why we preach on what kind of music you listen to, because it carries spirits. Rap music is not created to give you joy. It's not created to give you love. Country music is not given, made to make you more happy. Rock and roll music is not, it's not there to make you joy, to make you joyful or happy. It's there to anoint you with the wrong spirit to lead you down a path of self-destruction. There's the right condition and the wrong condition. I want to create the right atmosphere. I'll bow your heads with me this morning. Every head bow. Just play something for me. If you could. We are not ignorant, the scripture says, of his devices. How many want to say here, maybe father, mother, say, Lord, don't let me be ignorant of Satan's devices. 
Maybe, maybe, not a, maybe not even for as a parent. Maybe you just want to pray that in your own life to say, Lord, give me discernment. It's not, about, it's not about legalism or just getting rid of it. What do we do? We just throw it all away and just burn it all. Don't be on the internet. Don't be on the phones. Just, just live somewhere. Brother Brandon said he thought that way. Just go live with the Indians. Then he found out there was bad Indians too. It's bad, no evil, no matter where you go. It's the flesh and blood. The phone is not the issue. The Instagram is not the issue. Facebook is not the issue. It's the dimension behind that's trying to influence you. So what do we do? We put on the whole armor of God. How many can say that here today? To say, Lord, finally, I want to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Oh, hands raised up everywhere. I want to today, Lord, I want to put on the whole armor of God. I want to put on the whole armor of God. I want to stand with my loins girt with truth. I want to put on the breastplate of righteousness. I want to every day I wake up and go out. I want to, before I go through the day, I want to make sure, okay, do I have my breastplate? Do I have my shield? Do I have my helmet of salvation? Is my feet shod with the gospel of the preparation of peace? Have I prayed in the spirit with all supplication? Lord, I want to put on the whole armor of God. I want to be able to withstand and to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I want my home to be a fortress against the power of the enemy. I want my mind to be a castle, to be a fortress with walls of protection that keep the devil out and keep the Holy Spirit in. I want my family to be enshrouded with the Holy Ghost. I want the token to be applied to my home. Oh, how many want that here today? To say, Lord, protect me from the wiles of the enemy. Protect my family from the schemes of the wicked one. Protect my children's minds. Give me discernment, Lord. Give me wisdom. Don't let me just turn them loose and let them just do anything and go anywhere, play anything, have anything. That's why God put you there, parent. He made you a parent over that child for a purpose. Not just to feed them, not just to clothe them, but to nurture them and raise them in the admonition of the Lord. Oh, how many just want strength here today? Say, Lord, give me strength. Give me strength, Lord. Give our family strength. Give our church strength. Let us raise up when the enemies come rushing in like a flood. Let us raise up a standard against him. To be a standard against the devil and his schemes and his plans and his tactics. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Could you sing that song, Brother Harry, There's No One Greater Than Jesus? Oh, let's just worship him here just for a moment. Yes, Lord. I was so bound up. My heart was so oh, yes. tied up. No peace within. Think about it now. Chains could not hold. Soon, so lonely, so lonely, so shackled with sin. Then, yeah. Hallelujah! From of the sea, his eyes of compassion. Sing to me. Oh, Legion, you had me bound oh, yeah. so long. But my morning, but my morning has broken. Oh, I'll sing big oh, yeah. this song.
neighbors Ever detested. No peace within. I was the talk of conversation for my multiple relations. Sin. Oh, yeah. noonday, as the sun was burning down, I hid my face from embarrassment from my lifestyle. praise Lord Jesus high and lifted up I lift your name in this place Lord hallelujah hallelujah oh how many just want to raise a hand to the Lord and say Lord untangle me this morning oh God untangle any bondage that Satan has put me in if he's wrapped my mind up and wrapped my family up wrapped my children up untangle the mess this morning Lord let me come to you clean again Lord set me free Break every chain. Oh, as we preached last night, loose him and let him go. Oh, that's the message for this weekend, and you can receive it right now. How many just want to receive that and say, set me free, Lord. Set my family free. Set my spirit free to worship you. Let me not just raise my hands in this dimension. Let me break through another dimension. Let me worship you in spirit this morning. And in truth, loose him and let him go. Let our families go, Satan. Let our children go, Satan. Oh, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray this prayer, Lord, over our families, over our homes, over our lives, Lord God. Maybe someone would be here, every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you just want to pray. Maybe you want to come to this altar. Maybe right there at your seat, you want to say, Lord, maybe I've done it wrong, or uh, maybe I've made some mistakes, and allowed certain things that I realize have given place to the devil in my family. But right now, I want to rebuild and reconstruct the altar. I want to reconsecrate my life. I want to reconsecrate my family. I want to reconsecrate my children and my home. I want to make Jesus first place again. I don't want the devil to have any part or any place. Oh, hands up all over the building. Hold those hands up before God. Yes, Lord, you see, that's the desire of our heart this morning. That's our prayer, Lord Jesus. We want what you want for our lives, oh God. We want you in the first place. We want you to take the steering wheel. Lord, we want to give you control of our decisions, of our choices. This is important, oh God. Satan is raging more than ever before. He's attacking us, Lord. 
on every hand, these millions of demon spirits uh, unleashed upon our minds, upon our homes and people battling addiction and depression and oppression, maybe feeling oppressed by a spirit even here today in the house of God. But Lord, may you set them free this morning. May freedom, may they hear freedom's call and accept it today, Lord God. May you come and loose them and let them go. May they walk before you free. That's our prayer, Lord, to walk before you in freedom. Freedom, free of all people, free of all pressure. Oh, how many want to just let off the pressure this morning? Say, make me free this morning, oh God. Make me free, Lord Jesus. Let me serve you, Lord. Not just, not, I'm not just happy with life. I want to have unlimited life. I don't want to be bound in my hands or my eyes or my feet. I want to walk before you, Lord Jesus. Free. Free, Lord Jesus. Could we sing that song? There's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. You believe it this morning, church? You appreciated the word this weekend? Lord, speak to your heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is power oh, yes. in the name oh, I believe. of Jesus. Oh, there, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain to break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. There's an army rising up. Oh yeah. There's an army rising up. There is an army rising up. We will break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain.
give myself away I give myself away so you can use me it's not easy but I give myself away
isn't he wonderful he's beautiful amen sometimes you get a song it just has to come out and it don't come out right but that's just how it comes out can't nobody do me like jesus can't nobody do me like the lord can't nobody do me like jesus he's my that you've ever done uh -huh. and what it did for you and you claim that since you come to know him he's been so much better uh -huh. then it should do something for you you say brother Joel you're trying to get me to act like you know I'm trying to get you to act like what's really on the inside of you uh -huh. it's not about being black and being expelled I know what the prophet said about my people because uh -huh. I am my people Man. but sometimes there has to be something on the inside of you that makes you do something completely totally different right. to get you out of your comfort zone uh -huh. I'm talking about the old people who got an ache in the back and the knees and the lumbago and everything else. I'm talking about the young people that got a little more energy. Everybody should be excited. Amen. Everybody should be expressive. Okay, oh, no.
man, I'm telling you about my toes were in the back. My toes were back here in the back part of my shoe. But I can still say praise God because it's the truth. Because my pastors taught me I'm a man of truth and all truth belongs to me. Whether I like it or not. Amen. God bless you. Go in the fear of the Lord. Just, uh, just go in the Lord. Do something for Jesus Christ today. Submit yourself to the gift that's on the inside of you to be a light to those in darkness. Amen. You know he, God bless you, healed my body and he told me to run on. He healed my body and he told me to run on. He healed my body and he told me.